What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope y'all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be talking about the first day of the U.S. versus Maxwell trial. I was doing live tweeting all throughout the morning, and uh, some people showed up. Uh, not that many. Uh, it's the first day of the trial, and uh, I'm guessing most people work during the day, especially my American audience. So uh, the uh, the tweet thread is still there for you guys if you want to go check it out. It's the pinned tweet, the top one, and uh, you can go and read all the updates here. So it was kind of a pain in the ass to do this because I was talking to my journalist sources on the ground and at the same time um, writing this up for you guys and texting with them and on being on the phone with them. Uh, it was kind of exciting, but also a pain in the ass. Uh, after a while, after like five, five, six hours, it was kind of tiring. But nevertheless, you know, we have to keep up with the trial. So uh, if you want to know the step by step, you can go and uh, look at my pinned tweet on top and you can see all the updates that I did all throughout the day. Yeah. If you want to uh, check out the second day of trial, then go to my Twitter. There'll be a link for it in the description box. And uh, the pinned tweet will say trial day number two or something like that. And then the uh, tweet thread will just go on and on for the whole day. OK, so that's how it's going to work. So if you want to tune in, you can do that. Um, so let's go over basically what happened. So the morning started out pretty slow because uh, the jury selection wasn't completely um, over because there are some scheduling problems that some of the jurors had. One juror had um, problems with their job, not being able to uh, get paid leave to come to jury duty, which I think should be by law. Uh, doing this civil duty should be paid either by the business more, or more uh, preferably by the government. The government would recoup the uh, the hours that the employer had to pay if it's a small business. So something should be done so that people can have peace of mind and come to jury duty and do their civil uh, civil duty to their society. So I think I, I want that to happen. I think that's a big problem that we have right now. Um, and the second person had a surprise vacation put on them by their spouse. Now, at least that's, a, that's what they said. Maybe they were trying to get off a of jury duty. Who knows? But I think that person ended up staying. So uh, I, but both the uh, situations with the jurors were resolved. And even if uh, some jurors had to be excused, there's like there's a lot of more other reserved jurors left so the uh, so that if any problems arise the uh the judge can call on them so anyways jury the jury was selected and sworn in um in the morning and by after lunch the opening arguments started okay so we're going to be going through the opening arguments here and uh, i'm going to break down what what the prosecution said first because they went first then the defense I, if you watch my videos you know you know exactly what they're going to say because i predicted for you guys like last week or two weeks ago what the basic case of Gill and Maxwell is going to be. And it's exactly what I said. Um, and if you watch those videos, you know what I said. I'll I'll go at, as I go along, I'll break it down for you guys. But let's get started here. So Pomerant started in narrative form, which is how most prosecutors start. It's it's uh, telling stories to people is the best way to appeal to humans because we like stories. That's why the, we love movies so much and TV shows. And we just like the narrative form. And so uh, Pomerantz was the one who was uh, doing the opening. Uh, she's one of the assistant U.S. attorneys for the Southern District of New York. Uh, Maureen Comey was also there, who's another excellent prosecutor. And uh, uh, Alex Allison Mo, obviously, and I'll put I'll put a, a picture of uh, all those people on the screen right now, so you guys uh, know who they look like, and um, and yeah, so she started saying uh, the following quote: "I want to tell you guys a story about a girl named Jane," and then she she was basically talking about one of the victims, and she they have to three of the victims are are unknown one of the victims is annie farmer we all know her i think she's minor victim number two uh the other minor victims are unknown they're anonymous for this for the sake of privacy they, they didn't want to reveal their names and that's a right of uh of victims of this kind of uh, crime where they don't want to release their uh names and the court abides by that um the obviously they have they've been verified by the government they've been verified by the court so the, the courts know who they are. The, we, they just don't want the public to know their names. So the res court respects their anonymity. OK, so that's why these girls are referred to. Three of them are referred to as Jane. The fourth one is Annie Farmer. We all know her. So this is what Pomerant said. And I basically uh, paraphrase slash quoted what they were saying, according to my sources from the ground, from the courtroom. Um, so this is what she said. Pomerant said Jane was introduced to a man and a woman at a camp. The man described himself as a donor to the camp. Um, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was a donor for many different uh, colleges and other places. The, that's how he got legitimacy by giving money to these legitimate organizations like universities for doing scientific research. Some of the research was actually good. So this is how 
like criminals and other people try to seem legitimate by giving money to legitimate causes and making themselves seem like they're, you know, legit people or helping out good causes and the causes are good. They're not, that doesn't make them good people, right? That's why they do this stuff. That's why they pretend to help people. Not, not, I'm not saying everybody who, do, who does that charity is evil or something. I'm just saying that a lot of criminals try to do this kind of stuff to try to pretend like they're helping the community to make themselves seem less criminal because they're actually doing criminal stuff. And that's what uh, Jeffrey Epstein was doing. So they went to a, they went to this camp. They were recruiting at camps and Gillen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were the ones who were there and talking to these girls. Quote, what Jane, this is what Pomerant said. What Jane didn't know, the girl who was being recruited, is that the man and woman were predators. Who was that woman targeting young girls for sex abuse? Uh, it was the defendant, Gillian Mackle. That's a direct quote from uh, from AUSA. Uh, that's Assistant U.S. Attorney Pomerantz, who was doing the opening arguments for the government. She goes on to say, she put them at ease. Also, they could be molested by a middle-aged man. That's a quote from her again. There were there were times when she was in the room when it happened, as Annie, Annie Farmer has described. Pomeranz went on to say Maxwell and Epstein were partners in crime who, quote, promised these girls the world, uh, going after girls from difficult homes and broken families. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, Courtney Wilde had a broken family. She had problems at home. Uh, Maria Farmer and Annie Farmer had some money problems. They weren't from the wealthiest background. And they Maria Farmer wanted to become an artist. And uh, Annie Farmer wanted to have international experience so that she can use it on her college applications to get into a good college. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what job Annie Farmer wanted to do. I think she's a psychologist now. But, um, but anyways, these were people with money problems and home life problems, family problems. And that's what that's the vulnerability that uh, that Jeffrey Epstein targeted. OK, and Gillian Maxwell. She went on to say they figured out what these girls wanted to do when they grew up and they promised to help. And that's what that's exactly what they targeted. Uh, Courtney Wilde was just trying to look for any kind of security when it comes to having some money to spend for herself to buy clothes and food and stuff and just to feel economically secure. That's what Courtney Wilde was looking for. And uh, that's what Jeffrey Epstein provided in some ways. And then, of course, there was a much bigger price to pay for those provisions. <clears throat> she went on to say, um, Pomerantz went on to say, they made these girls feel seen, seen, and also safe. Uh, they made these girls feel special, but that was a cover. Um, and then regarding Jeffrey Epstein's massages, quote, what was happening inside those massage rooms was not a massage, it was sexual abuse. Okay, so that's straight from Pomerantz. She went on to say he directed girls to massage him while he masturbated. He sometimes received oral sex and he sometimes penetrated the girls' uh, vaginas with his penis. So he, she gave a warning to the jury that there's some of this information would be disturbing before she actually went on to say that. I should have mentioned that. If you've been paying attention to this case, you know exactly what we're talking about here. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But um, yeah, there's going to be some explicit content here. Okay, at least that's the most explicit part here. Uh, quote, sometimes she, Maxwell, touched the girls' bodies as well, and we know this from Annie Farmer as well, during the massages. Uh, Pomerantz went on to say, ladies and gentlemen, Jane was not the only one. Maxwell and Epstein ran a, quote, pyramid scheme of abuse, encouraging girls to bring other uh, friends of theirs to be rewarded with cash. That's the famous $200 that the, some, a lot of these girls were paid in um, in Florida. Um, Courtney Wilde was given $200 every time she brought in one of her friends. Courtney Wilde was 14 when this stuff was happening to her, when she was first recruited by Jeffrey Epstein. So they can't really be held criminally liable for what they were doing because they were children. They were being used by this guy to recruit more girls. Uh, Pomerantz went on to say, you also hear Epstein's staff, including the pilot, that's uh, Vysalski, uh, for the private planes that he had and employees from his properties. Those are some of the people who are going to be uh, testifying. And uh, the pilot for the private planes, uh, Larry Vasalski, he testified today for the government. He was the first witness to testify, and we'll get to that later on. Pomerantz went on to say, you'll see FedEx receipts confirming that Epstein sent a gift to one of his victims when she was 15 years old. They were exploiting kids. They were trafficking kids for sex. OK, so that was basically it. That's a summation of the uh, government's opening statement. They hit everything that need to be hit. Um, it was very short. I thought it was very short, but nevertheless concise. 
right? So I described it as short and sweet because they hit all the points that needed to be hit. They, they, you know, they got, they got right to the point, no uh, fussing around, right to the crimes that they're going to allege and they're going to try to prove in this case. Okay, so it was very to the point and I liked it. And they basically mentioned everything that I would have mentioned. Um, I don't, yeah, I think almost everything that, that you wanted to hit for these this specific case, they hit it there. So I think the opening arguments were um, short, but nevertheless concise by Pomerantz. And uh, next, we had Bobby Sternheim, obviously, for the defense, Gillian Maxwell's lawyer. And uh, she went next after a little break. So we're going to be going over what she said here. Bobby Sternheim started, started with the following quote. This is straight from her mouth. Ever since Eve was accused of tempting Adam for the apple, women have been blamed for the bad behavior of men, and women are often villainized and punished more than the men ever are. And I I, uh, said, women's card deployed. That, like, that's that's what she's doing. She's basically saying that all of uh, womankind has been under attack and women are often blamed for men's mistakes. Now, that might be true, but that's not what's happening here. She's trying to pretend as if her client didn't participate or was not a willing participant in any of this. And this is just a vendetta by the government uh, going after Gill and Maxwell because they can no longer go after Jeffrey Epstein. That's That's been their whole narrative, one of their main narratives, right, when it comes to why the government is pursuing Gill and Maxwell. Because they have always maintained that Gillian Maxwell did nothing wrong, that she was actually a victim of Jeffrey Epstein. They also tried to push that nonsense. Um, but yeah, so people who've been paying attention know that's not true. But the jury does not know because the jury's, for the most part, is people who haven't heard this case. So so the government's going to have to really take that apart and show the jury that this she was not some kind of unwilling participant here, but that she was actually involved and she was getting rewarded, uh, you know, with lavish uh possessions, luxuries when she was with Jeffrey Epstein. This was not some kind of forced relationship. She was a willing participant, uh, Gillian Maxwell, when she was doing all this stuff. Okay. Next, she went on to say that she's proud to represent Maxwell, uh, saying the government story relies upon the claims of four accusers. She emphasized the time period of the indictments dating back decades to the 1990s, basically starting to attack the memory angle, saying that this was a long time ago and these girls might not be remembering what they're saying, which has been another line of attack that they're doing. Right. Uh, She continued to say, quote, as we all know, memories fade over time. So here we go. And in this case, we will learn not only have memories faded, but they have been contaminated by outside information, media reports and other influences. And I put in here that this is where Je- Elizabeth Loftus comes in. That's that expert that I covered. She's not really an expert, in my opinion. Uh, technically, she has a lot of experience and a lot of uh, academic uh, awards, you can say, or academic position. But her theories are kind of stupid. And I went I did a whole video explaining why her memories are ridiculous. The the basic idea that memories can fade over time, that's true, okay? The idea that everything that we know about ourselves from our childhood is false and it's been edited by new memories who are inserting themselves all the time into our memory, that's a bunch of nonsense, okay? That's some, I don't know what that is, but that's insane, okay? Some small details here and there might change in your memory, but the idea that these girls would forget everything that happened to them is ridiculous, okay? And that they would make up stories and substitute memories Elizabeth Loftus, I don't I don't believe her theories, but this is the line of attack that, that they're doing here, which is trying to attack the memories, try to say that this was back in the 1990s. This was a long time ago. Memories fade. They might not be remembering things correctly. So the jury should not be listening to them. They're not really credible. This is all attacking the credibility of the witnesses. That's 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 one of their main. Um, that's their only theme, actually. They're, she's going to she's going to claim in a second that they're all gold diggers as well. So they're gold diggers and their memories suck and they got money uh, the gold diggers. They got money from Jeffrey Epstein's uh, Jeffrey Epstein's estate. So we're getting to that. But I just gave you guys a preview, basically. She also went on to attack some civil attorneys who have been representing some of the girls, saying that uh, they're all frivolous lawsuits. And the only reason that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein have been uh, have been targeted is because they're prominent people. And in, in terms of. Uh, in, in terms of uh, Gillian Maxwell, this is what she has to say. Epstein's death left a gaping hole for the justice for these women. Um, she also said uh, Maxwell is a brand name. She's a lightning rod. 
She's a convenience uh, stand in for the man who and then she was cut off by the government. The exact objection was not made clear um, from the reporting that I got. But anyways, the government objected to most likely because she was just attacking the victims um, in her opening statements. But that's part of their defense. So like, like I said before. Gillian Maxwell has a right to defend herself and Gillian Maxwell's lawyers have a right to come up with a theory of the case as long as it doesn't violate the rules of evidence and it actually somehow met, mat matches up with the facts and evidence, right? Because uh, you can't just make up any story. They, they can make up a story as long as it you know, relatively uh, sticks to the facts. And the jury is the one who's going to decide whether whose story is more accurate based on the facts that they're presented. So you can, you, for the most part, they have a lot of liberties to tell a story of their narrative, their interpretation of what happened here, because the defense does have a right to defend themselves. And the jury is going to have to decide whether they buy that defense. OK, so they uh, if I was the prosecutor, I wouldn't have I would not have objected to their narrative. You can say whatever you want, because I think the government's case is pretty strong. So let them say whatever they want in their opening statements and then go on from there. But anyways, the uh, the prosecutors objected and then they went to a sidebar. They talked to the judge. And then afterward, the judge probably said, you know, calm it down a little bit. So then Sternheim moved on to talking about how Gillian Maxwell has been unfairly targeted. So this is what she said. Quote, privileged background, comfortable lifestyle status. They may be things that easily check the wrong box, but they are not crimes. Basically trying to say, don't hate the rich. Don't hate on the rich lady. That's basically what she was saying uh, after, uh, after the sidebar. She went on to say, Quote, I wish I could tell you a progressive once upon a time narration like uh, Pomerantz did, but the evidence is not conducive to that. And that was to counter um, Pomerantz's opening statements where she began with the story of Jane, a narrative, a progressive narrative, progressive meaning just standing of the victims. Yeah, I guess you can call that progressive. Um, basically saying that she was trying to make it seem like this is not a story about the the uh, the victims. This is a story about how Ghislaine Maxwell is the one is the real is the real victim here, and she's the one who's been targeted unfairly targeted by the uh, by the police and by the media and by the FBI and by the prosecutors because you know they can't get Jeffrey Epstein. So the real victims here, according to uh, Bobby Sternheim, is Ghislaine Maxwell, and this is expected. This is what what else is she going to say, right? She's the lawyer for Ghislaine Maxwell, so it's kind of expected, but. I don't I, like I can't imagine anybody buying this. But I guess if you don't know much about the case, like most of these jurors, then I guess you might be able to accept it. So like I said, I, I know so much because I've been paying attention to this that I can't really put myself in the mind of somebody who knows nothing about this case. It's very difficult, right? Because like we see ourselves from our own frame and it's really hard to put ourselves in somebody else's body when it comes to like forgetting information that you already know. So it's difficult. But I hope the jury doesn't fall for this nonsense. Uh, Sternheim said the, the themes of this case are the following, quote, memory, manipulation, and money. Okay, those are the themes to her, to Sternheim, that this case is all about. Okay, and uh, this is like, that summarizes what I said regarding what their strategy is going to be. So I made a video um, a couple of weeks, I think two weeks ago, called Maxwell Trial Strategy, where I said that she's going to try to discredit the memories of the victims. They already did that, and they're going to continue to do that. And they're going to claim that they're gold diggers and the manipulation part. She's saying that the media and the government have manipulated reality to make it seem like Gillian Maxwell is the bad is the bad person when really Gillian Maxwell is the victim. That's what I think that's what she means by manipulation. But the memory part is clear. They're going to attack the she's going to attack the memory of the victims and uh, the money part. You're going to find out what the money part means. It's just calling the girls gold diggers. That's the primary move of all the rich uh, individuals who've been accused of any kind of sex crimes, right? Blame the victim. Um, yeah, so let's move on here. And this is, this is to the gold digger point. This is what she says, quote, Each of the witnesses who are testifying here received money from the Jeffrey Epstein Compensation Fund. Yes, of, of course they did, because they were harmed emotionally and physically by Jeffrey Epstein. And since he's dead and in this country, in a capitalist country, the only way that civil lawsuits and civil disputes are, are resolved is by one party giving money to the other. So if you have a problem with that, 
then you have a problem with the entire legal system. Okay, so what else were they going to do but to sue the Jeffrey Epstein estate? And the way that that um, the restitution is made to people who are harmed is through money. That's the way we do it in this society. If you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with the entire system. I have some problems with it, but um, but yeah. So this this is not the time to address that. OK, so trying to say that, oh, these these girls got money. Yeah, of course they got money. What else are they going to do? Jeffrey Epstein is dead. OK, they can't get justice in any other way. That's the closest you can get. So I'm, I'm tired of the whole civil. I'm tired of the whole money grubber, gold digger argument. It's so stupid because this is how civil lawsuits are are uh, resolved in America. Next, Bobby Sternheim moves to discredit the victims. Number one, Annie Farmer. So the, she, that's the first uh, person she attacks saying, quote, you will learn that she was above the age of consent in New Mexico because some of the abuse that happened to Annie Farmer happened in New Mexico. The problem with this argument is, of course, that that was not the only place where the abuse happened. So technically, yes, yeah, she's right. The uh, statute of limitation uh, for uh, the, the age of consent, I should say, in New Mexico is 16, right? If you have uh, uh, relations with somebody who's under the age of 16, then you're in trouble. But as long as they're 16, you're not in trouble in New Mexico, right? But that's what they were focusing on by saying that that um, that that Annie Farmer didn't actually, well, there was no uh, crime committed against her because she was 16, so it was proper. Annie Farmer, if you, if you haven't seen her description of what happened to her, uh, it it's in the first documentary, uh, Filthy Rich, and she describes what happens to her with Jeffrey Epstein and Gillian Maxwell in New Mexico in that ranch. OK, uh, the Zorro Ranch or whatever the hell it is. Um, I've done some videos on that. It was a long time ago. I haven't talked about the ranch for a while. But anyways, that's what they're talking about. And then the AUSA, the uh, prosecutors objected because uh, because this is not the only place that the crimes were committed. So I ref I put that in reference. I put in my own uh, li like comments here and there because I wanted to give more context to the description where uh, this, to the events we're describing here. For reference, the age of consent in New Mexico is 16, but the abuse was not limited to New Mexico because there were other states where the age of consent was higher and uh, she was 16 when this happened. So that's why that's important. So they're going to they're gonna try to find, the defense is going to try to find every angle to discredit the, the victims and to attack the government's case. So the government has to be on their feet and paying attention. And that's what that's what um, that's what the prosecutor was doing when she objected, because they're good. They're good lawyers. OK, so all the people attacking Comey and, and Pomeranz, give it a rest. OK, you don't, you don't know anything about them. Your political hack arguments are pathetic. Uh, Maureen Comey is a great lawyer. That's why she's in the position that it, that she's in. You may not like her dad, but don't attach her dad to her. She has nothing to do with her dad. She's an excellent prosecutor. And that's why she was chosen for this case. So after attacking Annie Farmer, she then moved on to attack um, the history of drug abuse that one of the other victims have and uh, basically saying that she's not credible and she's not somebody you should be listening to. This is how they try to discredit the uh, the uh, actual victims who show up to testify. This is uh, par for the course. And uh, it should be mentioned, as I mentioned here. Most psychologists agree that victims of physical and mental abuse often resort to drugs and alcohol to cope. That's why a lot of these girls have drug problems and have alcohol problems, because they've been having to deal with the psychological torment of what they went through. That's why these uh, victims of sex abuse usually turn to turn, turn to drugs. So you should understand that context. And um, so, yeah, so that's. So you guys can see where, where they're going with their attacks, attack the victims. That's all they can do, really. I mean, you can't really, as a defense attorney, what else are you going to do but to try to discredit the victims? So as a strategy, it's a good one. It's the only one they really have, right? If, whether it's going to work depends on the jury. Next, <clears throat> quote, uh, this is uh, Bobby Sternheim speaking. They, the government, will not overcome the burden. They will not overcome reasonable doubt. What else are you going to say? The government is trying to uh, stitch together the stories of four different people, four stories to show a pattern. And this is where the gold digger point comes in. Let me show you guys. She called the pattern, quote, big bucks. That's the only pattern between these four girls, not the abuse, but the fact that they got big bucks from the Epstein Victim Compensation Program. 
So I said, this is exactly what they're going to do in my video where I talked about the uh, Jeffrey Epstein compensation program with Jordana uh, Feldman. I'll link that video in the top right hand corner. Um, it was not that it was not that hard of a prediction. I mean, what else are you going to do? Of course, you're going to call them gold diggers. That's why they subpoenaed information from uh, from the Jeffrey Epstein victims compensation program, because they wanted that those monetary amounts to say that they were just looking for big bucks that that they're all everything they did when they're in their legal papers matches up with their uh with their opening opening statements and their strategy so as soon as i read those legal filings i knew exactly what kind of strategy they were going to use it's very clear i mean if you know anything about the law you know what, how it's going to go down so so yeah, their that's their strategy. Call the gold, uh, the women gold diggers, and say they're drunks and and they did drugs and their memory is unreliable. This is it, okay? This is their strategy, and it's not it's not a really new strategy either. And that was the end of uh, Bobby Sternheim's opening opening statement for the defense. And then the court took a fifteen or ten minute break, I think, and uh, they came back with the government's first witness. So after the opening arguments are complete, then the government uh, starts their presentation of the evidence, which includes their witnesses. So they started with their first witness, who was uh, Lawrence Paul Wasalski, also known as Larry Wasalski, who was the uh, who was the uh, the pilot who flew uh, Jeffrey Epstein's planes. I'm not. I'm sure he's not the only one, but uh, he was one of the main ones who was doing um, the flying when this stuff was happening. I think he also had a professional relationship with one of the girls, one of the co-conspirators from uh, Florida, the uh, Slovak one. I forgot her name, um, Marcinkova, right? So yeah, uh, that's probably if you know his name, that's where you know his name from. Um, I, I read a whole bunch of documents about him a while ago. I think the releases that happened back in uh, June or July in 2020 had his name in a couple of them i remember his name i recognize his name oh you know what he's also involved in the virgin islands case that's where i know him from because i covered not only i covered almost every single lawsuit that all every single civil lawsuit and criminal lawsuit that's against jeffrey epstein and his state and the virgin islands one involves posalski because he was flying people around um around all these places gill and maxwell and jeffrey epstein were flying around with him so that's why he's relevant here and that's what they're at that's what uh the government asks asked him about so comey AUSA Comey was the one who was uh, asking questions here. So he was asked about different things having to do with what he saw between Jeffrey Epstein and Maxwell. There, the government is trying to establish that they were together, they were traveling together, and these girls were being flown in on these planes. Okay, that's that's what they're getting to with the pilot because that's the relevance he has to this case. So this is what he said. Larry said, uh, I was captain during the initial part. I was a pilot. Yes, he was asked about what his role was with Jeffrey Epstein. He said he was hired in Ohio in 1991 by Epstein. Wasowski said he was flying Epstein around every four days or so. Uh, some locales that they visited, Palm Beach to Santa Fe, New York, and St. Thomas. Uh, one of my sources told me, so I didn't put in Saint, Little St. James, but that should be in there because we know from the Virgin Islands case that uh, Wasowski was also flying girls in to the Virgin Islands, uh, to the uh, Little St. James uh, mansion or whatever you want to call it, his house over there. So it's it, all the places that he that we know Jeffrey Epstein was. He was flying p girls into there. OK, next, Comey went on to ask him about the nature of Maxwell's and Epstein's relationship. And this is what Wasowski said, quote, it was more personal than business. Um, and then he was asked, how long did that romantic relationship last? Then he said in the 2000s, he said in the 2000s, I wouldn't even characterize it as romantic. Uh, Larry went on to say that it was more couple-ish. And we know from the testimony from Gillian Maxwell herself that she was initially looking for kind of a romantic relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, but he was not interested. So she said that, I believe, in the first um, deposition that I covered. So that must have been the June 2016 deposition, because I remember distinctly talking about this so, uh, because uh, in the deposition, she was asked about her relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. And she said that it was not romantic or that she was she wished that it was romantic. And then but never, nevertheless, it never turned out to be. So it was never a sexual relationship because we know that Gillian Maxwell is not really his type, even back then when she was younger. So Wasowski said that it was a personal relationship, but not romantic. So it was like a mix of business 
and they had an affinity for it, each other because they were doing things together like recruiting these girls and he had a fondness for her not necessarily like a business like a cold business relationship so there's some warmth there between them but it was not like a sex thing right it was not a ro romantic relationship or a sexual relationship it was a different kind of intimate relationship um, like people who trusted each other with what what they were doing next the prosecutors asked him about his properties um, Vosalski went on to describe the interior of Epstein's New York mansion in detail as pictures of the houses are entered um, into evidence and showed to the jury by the prosecutor. So I'm sure that's going to be relevant uh, in a second, maybe to establish that he was actually there. But anyways, he was with Jeffrey Epstein for a long time. He went to his property, so he knows how the insides look like. So, uh, so yeah, we don't I, like. I don't have every single thing that the prosecutor said word for word. So some of this I'm filling in, but but with logical and good reason, right? And uh, that was the last thing that uh, he was asked about for today. This is the first day of trial, so just we're just getting started. Judge Nathan likes to be punctual, so the jury was dismissed. Uh, right right at 5 p.m. when the day ends. And uh, we're going to be picking back up with Larry Wasowski's testimony tomorrow. And I can kind of guess what the prosecutors are going to ask, but I'm going to cover it, so we'll know for sure. But uh, that was it for the first day. Uh, like I said... If you want to make, if you want to get all the updates on this, make sure you're uh, following me on Twitter. I'll be doing live tweeting once again tomorrow, or you can just catch it afterwards because I'll be doing another review of the day at the end of the day tomorrow, just like I'm doing one today. But if you want to catch it as it's going on, it will be the pinned tweet on on my Twitter. So as soon as you go to my Twitter account, uh, the first tweet you're going to see it's going to be pinned. It's going to say trial day two, and it'll have all of the updates as they come in to me we are my sources okay so uh that's that painstaking work for sure uh, after a while but nevertheless uh you know we've been waiting for this for a long time so i'm happy to do it um but anyways that's it for this video so i don't have much else to say i think uh, it's gone on long enough and uh, i just want to say make sure to like the video subscribe hit the bell press all and make sure you're following me on twitter uh the handle is on the screen right now and lastly if you appreciate all the work i put into these videos and also um the updates i bring you guys on these cases make sure to check out my patreon you can support the show for one dollar a month a month right so that's a pretty uh pretty easy ask uh if you ask me crowdfunding is the only way that independent creators like myself can get paid because uh, youtube does not pay us at all uh, i make if i'm lucky like 175 dollars a month from youtube that's not even close to uh, any kind of uh living wage but um but yeah it's really hard to do youtube uh full time if you're not making if you're not getting like millions of views it's very hard to live on youtube salary so in uh, independent funding through Patreon patreon is how most creators make it because youtube does not pay us for the content that we provide them they make lots of money from the ads that play on uh, our videos and some of my videos are also demonetized so that's all there's also that but even the ones who are monetized they don't make that much money so it's really hard to make it on youtube and i think for some of these stories they kind of make it that way because youtube would like us to talk more about more mainstream stuff and less about this kind of stuff that they consider to be outside the norm uh, that they don't consider to be important but some people do consider it to be important which is why i covered this case okay but anyways like i said if you like my work and support me on patreon it would be much appreciated with that being said see you guys in my next video tomorrow as always peace if we press a case that we can't win we just tell the next victim that she's better off staying silent if we let Dastasio walk, we send a message to the rest of the world that in New York, the law doesn't apply to the rich and the powerful. We are here to even those scales, not cut and run.